we uh, moved on to our um, <clears throat> next episode, our next message, um, and I'm sure over the, the course of this sermon I will trip over this word, propitiation, and I'll probably say it wrong. So this word means atonement. So if I use the word atonement, it's because I'm not using propitiation. Okay? So atonement uh, means to atone for, to pay the price for. Uh, and so that's what that means. Uh, and it's obviously about redemption. So redemption and atonement is what we're talking about today. Uh, just as a side note, you'll be happy to know I bought a new iPad, uh, so we shouldn't have the same problems as last week, uh, where it suddenly died on me. Uh, so we should go straight through without any problems. And we pray that and we lift that to God and say, Lord, make iPads work properly. Uh, so we're going to look at our message, uh, and this is it. Still under the Christology <coughs> um, subject that we're looking at. Um, and... Uh, the three things that we're just going to quickly look into uh, is the doctrine of propitiation, see, of atonement, uh, the doctrine of redemption, and the implication of these two things, of redemption and atonement. Um, and so let's start, let's get straight into our message uh, with the doctrine of propitiation or atonement. What is the doctrine of it? What does it mean, basically, is what we're looking at. So this doctrine of propitiation explains how uh, the sacrifice Christ paid on the cross satisfies the requirements of a holy God. Uh, atonement is the satisfaction of God's holy wrath against sin. So going back to the sin thing we need to address, but this is really good stuff uh, that um, uh, reading about in the Bible and how actually God looks at us and how God looks at sin. Uh, the Greek word for this, which I haven't actually got on here, uh, is hal halosmos, and it means a sacrifice of atonement, and it's used in John to describe propitiation or atonement. Uh, that is in 1 John 2, verse 2, and it says, He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world. So it's the work of God to absorb his divine anger, um, righteous anger that he has over sin, towards sinful man. Um, and if it helps us to comprehend this idea of, uh, of absorbing, maybe you can think of this, uh, of absorbing divine anger, maybe we could think of God's wrath of this torrent of water just beating down on a sponge and just that sponge ever able to soak up God's wrath and God's anger. Uh, maybe if you, you're a picture person and you need that, maybe that's what it is, that torrent of water, but Jesus being the, the sponge, as it were, soaking up all that water, taking on all the torrent and the, the heaviness uh, of, of sin uh, in this case. John Stott, uh, he, he says about this, he's a writer, he says, the wrath of God is his steady, unrelenting, unremitting, uncompromising antagonism to evil in all its forms and manifestations. Uh, this is good news. Uh, we talked about how we are sinful, and we will do, do touch on that, obviously, because we uh, inherited sin. We, we had original sin through Adam. Uh, but now what we're looking at here, really, is God's wrath and anger towards sin. He has to be so against sin in order to do what he'd done. He has to be so much against it that it's completely opposite to him. So when we use these words, when we talk about the wrath of God, uh, maybe misuse slightly, maybe to fear, to scare people into believing in God, uh, but actually, in this case, the wrath of God and the reason why he's so angry and unrelenting is because of sin itself. It's because the sin that we do, and so he's angry at the sin. If he was more angry, if he wanted to take out his uh, anger on people directly, uh, we wouldn't be here today. So instead, what he does is the sin that we inherited, he, he attacks that. He, he, he wants it gone. He wants it completely paid for, completely taken away from his people. He sees the damage that it's do it does to his people. Uh, and you remember that before sin, there was a period before that in the garden where there wasn't sin. Uh, and so you know there is a period where we're meant to be this kind of uh, in a natural state with God where we're not uh, having sin in our lives. So we know that there is a, a period before sin uh, where we are in line and in alignment with God. So this is really uh, encouraging and it should be really encouraging stuff. So God's wrath 
uh, has wrath because wrath against sin is perfectly fitting in the expression of a holy God. Uh, and the reason for this, uh, the reason why God feels, uh, I say feels this way, I don't know what, if that's even a word for God, but certainly behaves this way, uh, is because sin belittles his holiness. It belittles who he is. Sin speaks into existence many lies about the way things really are. It doesn't speak the truth about how things or what things are. Sin doesn't recognise God's work. It doesn't want to. The questioning uh, in the Garden of Eden uh, was a question against God's creation. Uh, Did he really say that? Did he really tell you not to touch this tree of life? Did he really say that? It's because it's against sin. It's against what God creates, what God says. It doesn't recognise his worth. Therefore, sin cannot go unpunished. It cannot be allowed to go on spreading lies and false witness. And the reason he yields wrath is because of sin. And the reason sin deserves wrath is because he is holy. He is absolute purity. He cannot be mixed with sin. He's absolutely pure. Uh, John Murray, another writer, he says, uh, because he loves himself supremely, he cannot suffer what belongs to the integrity of his character and glory to be compromised or curtailed. He cannot compromise. He cannot say, well, this little bit of sin is okay. These sort of levels of sin, as some people like to call, as like to almost behave like, it's all right to tell lies, because that's not as bad as murdering someone. It is uncompromising. God says, all sin, all sin is against him. All sin does not represent who God is. He cannot compromise. He cannot be curtailed by sin. You might look at it this way. Imagine looking at a perfect sea of water. I don't know where that is, by the way. Imagine sitting by the beach, sitting looking over the sea, this perfect sea of water. Uh, It's blue, not grey as well. Isn't it amazing? It's blue, this perfect water, unpolluted, perfectly in balance as it was in God's creation. God God, God creates a perfect place of purity. Then look at this sea again, this time. Imagine an oil spill that has blighted the water. If you've seen any recent events of various oil spills over the past 10 to 20 years, you will know the devastating effect it has on sea life and on humans. Uh, And this is represented here where the oil is coming in. Uh, And these ships here, these barges, you might not be able to see them, but at the back, uh, they're trying to stop the oil from spreading and moving around. So they try and keep it in and then they try and collect it. They try and remove it. And there are many different methods that they do that. But this is how sin has blighted a perfect purity of God's creation. In both cases, we as people were responsible for Adam uh, bringing death into God's creation. We chose to take from the tree of life, of good and evil. People were irresponsible in how they maintained ships when oil spills occurred. But in both cases, there is a great hope. The oil never absorbs into water. A bit of science here. Oil never becomes water. Even when you mix oil and water together, have you noticed how the oil just floats around within the water? It never actually becomes. Even when it separates, it's still oil. It doesn't actually mix with the water at all. The oil always floats to the top because it's less dense than water. And oil and water don't mix because of water molecules are more attracted to each other than oil molecules. There you go, it's a science lesson for today. Um, But here it is. Uh, There are many methods, by the way, that they use to deal with oil spills. Uh, And every method, uh, no matter what one you look at, uh, it never, even when they add chemicals to disperse the oil, the oil still never actually uh, mixes with the water. Uh, there is a, a method called dispersion, uh, and what they do is they, they, mix, uh, oil, they mix a chemical with the oil, with the water, that makes the oil fall to the bottom of the sea. So it never actually disperses, it never actually removes it, and so in cases of wildlife being affected on the top level of the sea, where they think it's an urgent matter, they uh, deploy these chemicals, and it disperses and then sinks to the bottom of the sea. Uh, the problem, of course, is that the sea life deep in the bottom of the water. As we've seen in many 
wildlife program, many, many of programs of Richard Attenborough who shows this amazing creation, amazing wildlife, a deep, deep underwater. So no matter what we do, uh, the oil still uh, remains. Uh, the sea merely pushes it around, never eradicating it. So it needs this external actor, this external thing to come and physically remove it. And even when, uh, then whilst we have various methods, of, as I've described, to remove the oil from the water, they're not without risk. They're not perfect. They're not 100%. And it's the same way in regards to sin with us. Well, what can we do to remove it? We, we in ourselves can't do anything to remove that uh, from our lives. We are not uh, Jesus. We do not have um, that in our power. It would never be enough. Anything we do would never be enough to remove sin from our lives. We cannot separate sin from ourselves. We cannot separate the oil spill of sin from the purity of God's creation. Titus 2, verse 11 to 14, uh, he says, For the grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright and godly lives in this present age. While we wait for the blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God, God and Saviour, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what is good. We polluted God's creation. But Christ paid the price and cleaned it up, removing it entirely. Something we could never do. We can do many things as human beings. The one thing we cannot do is deal with the sin problem. So God sends his son to come and pay the price to ultimately remove, purify his people, as it says here. That's amazing. Christ's atonement for sin was the perfect method of removing sin from his creation without damaging creation itself. Isn't that amazing? Uh, when we think of these, uh, this example of the oil in the sea, all those methods actually still damage the thing that it is pure, the thing that still is, needs to stay there. So even the sea gets damaged and the, the water and all the minerals and all that in the, in the sea still get damaged. But when Jesus came, he specifically removed sin, the bad stuff from the world, the stuff that really doesn't honour him, that doesn't uh, honour God, and he takes that out. And he leaves, wants to put back that, that time of when we when without sin with God, when we walked in a garden with him, when we were before uh, the fall. Uh, and that is taking away that sin that we could never have dealt with. He not, only, uh, not only are we made clean through Christ, but Christ made creation righteous in the sight of God. And this makes God a sovereign God, who is great enough to stoop this low to rescue us. It gives him a mighty arm, able to stretch to the uttermost with love for those who deserve his anger. No longer are we in deserving of anger. Because of Christ, we no longer deserve anger, but we have received grace. We have received righteousness. Who can understand this wonder? Who can understand why God did this? Man would not make this up. If you... If you understand the basic concept uh, of the Bible, uh, just understand one of these things here. If you wrote a book like this, the last thing you would do if this was made up is say that man is terrible, wrongful and dark and here's God who is not part of us in that way. He's not, he, is a, he is the God and say well, you have to go to him, you have to give your life to him. No man, if this was made up, would ever write that in a book. No man you know, what, you know what man writes? You know what man comes up with when it's in his own word? We've seen it in other religions. We can be better people. We can do much better. We can do good. We can do good things. Karma. Sorry, it's rubbish. It's utter rubbish. I'm telling you now, not anything that man wrote, not God written through man, I'm talking what man wrote through his own ideas, it's not what God uh, done or does. What he does is he's chosen men, he's chosen people to come and write his word all about him and what he can do. No Bible, it's not a godly, holy Christian Bible, can ever bring that correct teaching to us. Man's way is not God's way. 
What do we do but bow speechless to this awesome God who just has given this great gift of grace, awesome power, awesome gift of Jesus Christ who has come, given his life, and rose again so that we can live for him. We should put our hands over our mouths in awe and say, wow, there's nothing I could do. But Jesus did it all. God has loved us with a love inexhaustible. Have you got an inexhaustible love, church? No. You know that from this morning, don't we? <laughs> we don't have an inexhaustible love. We get angry with people. We get annoyed with people. We're very short with people because we are imperfect in this current world. So what we do is uh, that anger, that sin is still there in terms of just wanting to please the flesh, please ourselves, put people down. We don't have inexhaustible love. God goes to the very end, to the very worst of people, and they too can be saved. That's inexhaustible love. Could you truly say, could we all truly say, that the worst person who would offend you to the highest level, who would just spit in your face because of what you believe, can you truly say that you would still speak to them with love and grace? Oh, you say that now, church, but it is not that easy when you're faced with the situation. It is not that easy when someone is shouting at you in your face because they hate what you believe. It is easy to say this now, but there is no way our love is anywhere near as great or as inexhaustible as God's love. And I think this brings us nicely onto the doctrine of redemption what does redemption mean? If you're, if, you're, if you're really looking at these verses today, at least two songs we sung are in, is in this sermon. I'm going to leave it to you to find them out. Revelation 5, verse 9, as I give you a hint, and they sang a new song. What song was that? Revelation song. And they sang a new song, saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals because you were slain and with your blood you purchase for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. There is a Greek word used to describe this principle of being purchased for God. Uh, the word is exagorazo. 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 Have you heard of that word before? Greek word? Exagorazo. Okay, let's go through it. The first part is the EX. That shouldn't be there. Let me go back. Uh, the first part is the EX, and it means out of. Yeah? Okay. That would make sense, wouldn't it? X to be out of. Yep, that's good. And then you get the, the next part, which is agorazo, which means marketplace. Sorry, agora, which means marketplace. And then agorazo, buying or purchasing something in that marketplace. Yeah. <laughs> it might be. <laughs> that's true. It's probably Argos, yeah. Um, it's amazing. This is one word, exagorazo, and it means three, different, three things put together. This is amazing, isn't it? Uh, Greek is just so fascinating the way it's done. Uh, but uh, agora meaning the marketplace, and then agorazo meaning to buy or purchase something in that marketplace. And there you go, exagorazo uh, means to buy from the marketplace. So why the Greek lesson? This word speaks of a very important and fundamental principle of redemption. Through redemption, Christ not only paid the price of sin, but also removed us from the marketplace of sin. Do you understand how powerful that is? If you go to a shop and you want to buy something, and they say it's out of stock, what do they do? Do they reorder it? They try and get it for you and they reorder it? In the case where you are bought by sin's death, uh, sorry, uh, by Christ's death for sin, you are no longer in stock. Does that make sense? In the marketplace where Christ came to buy you, you no longer there is no other stock. It's not returned. It's not. It's it's not cancelled. There is no more stock left of Colin. There is no more stock left of Dan. There is no more stock left of anyone because Christ buys us from the marketplace never to be resold again on that marketplace of sin. Does that make sense? That's powerful, isn't it? You can't go back. Once you, once you believe in Christ, 
You're not on market anymore. You're not on the market to be sold to anyone else except that Christ now has bought you, has bought, has paid the price for you. So not only uh, paid the price for sin, but also removed us from the marketplace of sin in order to give us full assurance that we'll never be returned to the bondage and penalties of sin. John 10, uh, 27 to 30 says, My sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. I give them eternal life and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. What song was that that we did today? Never let go. Through the calm, through the storm. Never let go. Yeah? Yeah. These songs don't get chosen randomly, you know, church. Actually, put some work into it and we put the songs on. But uh, I thought there was, a, there was so many other songs we could talk about here we could actually sing to in terms of these this actual subject, but uh, just to kind of give us that focus about uh, certainly you cannot be snatched from the Father's hand. And through the shedding of his blood, Christ has purchased us from the marketplace of sin and secured our freedom. We no longer are no longer in bondage to sin. We've been freed from slavery because Christ paid the ransom that was owed. He paid the price that was owed. So what is the uh, implication uh, of redemption it comes up. What is the implication of redemption and propitiation or atonement? What's the implications for us in this? The first one uh, is 1 Corinthians 6, verse 19 to 20. It's our redemption was paid for through the blood of Christ. And it says, Do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honour God with your bodies. The next one. We belong to the one who redeemed us. 1 Corinthians 7, 21-23 says, Were you a slave when you were called? Don't let it trouble you, although if you can gain your freedom, do so. For the one who was a slave when called to faith in the Lord is the Lord's freed person. Similarly, the one who was free... (sighs) When called is Christ's slave, you are bought at a price. Do not become slaves of human beings. Do not submit to the fear of man. Do not put yourself back on the marketplace of sin. You don't need to because God holds you tightly. Now you believe in him. Under obligation as willing subjects to obey the one who paid the atoning price. That's Romans 6, verse 19, and it says, I'm using an example from everyday life because of your human limitations. Just as you used to offer yourselves as slaves to impurity and to ever-increasing wickedness, so now offer yourselves as slaves to righteousness leading to holiness. We spoke about this a few weeks ago uh, when we were, I think it was in our Wednesday evening a study, and uh, we were talking about how do we... Uh, what do we do when we're faced with, with temptation of sin and are faced with God's righteousness? Uh, and it's not, it, it's not that we lay down, we just say, well, God made me righteous. Uh, it is a choice that we make to seek God every day, to seek his righteousness. It is something we, we do to move away from the temptation of sin. So when we move towards God's righteousness and seek him purposefully, go and do that instead of doing the wickedness, go and seek him on purpose then you move away from that temptation of sin because you're seeking him more, the purity, the righteousness of God. And remember, God is not associated with sin in any way that he has connected or waters it down or mixes it up. He cannot be mixed up with sin. So when we seek God, we move further away from the temptation of sin. There's one more. Let me check. Yes, one more here. Returning to our former condition as a slave to sin cannot be considered. This is in Romans 6 verse 13 and he says, Do not offer any part of yourself to sin as an instrument of wickedness, but rather offer yourselves to God. Remember, this is an action that we're doing. It's not automatic. We're doing this as I'm going to offer myself to God as those who have been brought from death 
to life and offer every part of yourself to him as an instrument of righteousness. Let no one ever say that being a Christian is an easy life. Uh, it is not. It's faced with challenges every day. And that means we have to seek his righteousness. That means we have to try and become the instrument of righteousness. God has redeemed us on the basis of the suffering of Jesus as our substitute. What should we do with the past things that of which we are ashamed? What should we do with those things that we are ashamed of? We can't pretend that we didn't do them. But it is a greater mistake to dwell on them. Jesus came so that those sins, those things we did in the past would be forgiven. The, the price of that sin would be paid for. Philippians 3, as Paul says here, Philippians 3, 12 to 13, says, not that I've already obtained all this or I've already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Remember, Jesus Christ did it first. He's the one who took hold of us first. And then we, as Paul is saying here, but because he took hold of me, I then press on in him. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it. This is from Paul. This is the one who is absolutely on fire for Jesus. And he says, I don't consider myself the one who's taken hold of it. You want to hold up all these apostles? Listen, they all had problems, right? They all had struggles. Every day trying to take hold of the glory that Jesus had given them. But one thing he says, one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. Are there things in our past that we need to leave behind? Not only leaving them behind, but moving forward away from them entirely. Out of his great love, God sent Jesus Christ into the world to die for our sins. So we could be forgiven and released from the penalty of our sins. He rose again so that if we follow him in obedience of faith, we will have peace for our conscience, purpose for our life, and a hope for the future, even to eternity. Redemption and atonement is the beginning of the work of Christ in us so that we can grab hold of it and move forward in him and do the work that he has laid ahead, commanded us, go and make disciples. Go and share the gospel. Go and speak into the lives of millions of people who have never heard of me, who are lost to the world, who can be redeemed because of Jesus Christ. That is the message of redemption and atonement. It is done. And so we do because it is done. Let's pray and then we'll say the blessing together. Father, we want to thank you that we have been redeemed because of uh, your gift, uh, because of Jesus Christ who came and bore all the weight of sin, uh, the weight of all the world's sin on his shoulders, who took it on. So, Father, we would be saved uh, if we believe and are obedient to our Lord Jesus, if we give our lives to him. He will and has redeemed us. He has paid the price. He has atoned for the cost of sin, the price of sin. And Lord, we just want to give you praise and hallelujah this morning that we have Jesus Christ in our lives today that we can say, I am his. I am his and he is mine. Father, we thank you for your son, Jesus. We thank you for the gift of grace that exists in this time. And Lord, we ask that your Holy Spirit comes and gives us that sense of urgency before Jesus returns so that our families, our friends, people that we meet will have some knowledge of you. And Lord, oh, do we pray that they will come to a saving knowledge of you. Father, we thank you that we can come here today, pray in your holy name, speak your name. And Father, we say in the name of Jesus, Lord, will you rescue this community? Will you rescue us when we are not at our best, when we are not aligned with you. Will you rescue those that we love, people that we're yet to meet, 
people in our families, our friends. Father, do with us what needs to be done so that we can share the gospel. We can share the awesome truth of Jesus Christ. We ask these things in your holy name. Amen.